Welcome to International Securities Exchange's podcast series. Facilitated by renowned educators, ISE podcasts are intended to teach beginning as well as seasoned investors the ins and outs of trading. To find an updated list of podcasts, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts. Michael has another one, Jack, and he says, are you forgetting about the size of the U.S. debt? And Barbara's question is, how will that affect this, you know, all this craziness? How, how is this going to affect the U.S. stock market? Obviously, none of us really know, but um, if it's deflation, then we're, we're basically sitting here quite possibly with, with a Dow of 11,000 high, right? I mean, if you're, I don't think stock markets like deflation, do they? Um, well, not I don't think not this type because if this type that we're talking about is is a is a global and um, you know profits generated you know the multinationals the globals you know the the, the biggest game in town um, so no and we're not forgetting about the government debt in fact that's a big part of this because of all the government debt pumped out by all the major you know, G7 countries Canada the exception t- um, you know to a degree um, it the the relative productivity um, of the economy is, is falling tremendously, um, meaning you have subpar growth um, in the future because of all because the the government is eating the private seed corn, so to speak. So that's all part and parcel to this undercapacity growth we think for many years, which is a de- again a deflationary impact. You don't have the you know the pricing power for that, um, you know. So that's a uh, you know, so it's, it's so it's so it's bad news because deflation, as we know, is very bad for creditors, um, and creditors are the ones um, that are you know that you know are you know the, which means the banks are not going to want put more and more money into the uh, real economy where it needs to get because of this deflationary problem and lack of uh, you know relative high yield um, projects. So it all it all goes together, that whole government debt problem. We haven't forgot about that. That's part of our deflationary scenario. People think that because high debt, right in that way, it has to be inflationary. We say this again and again. Look at Japan. Japan went from, what, 70 percent debt to GDP, I don't know, maybe even 50 percent debt to GDP when their economy started plunging in 1989. They're now at 200 percent debt to GDP, and they're in the worst deflation they've ever been in at the moment. So don't buy into this idea that high debt means inflation. It does not. No. I think we lost trillions, didn't we, Jack, in the last couple of years from the credit crisis? Yeah, yeah. It's just it's been a massive, in, in, in a massive hit, and, and that game is still going to continue because we were so over-leveraged, we think. Right. And, and, again, that private deleveraging is outweighing the public ability, the public side of debt being put into the market, and that's why the stimulus isn't stimulating. TJ has a point. He says, "What about what's the strong dollar going to do for stocks? Is there a you know, if you're an equity investor, you see the dollar going up. Is that going to be good for the U.S. multinationals? Does it matter because they're they're global? What do you think? It just depends on the environment. If the dollar goes up on a major risk aversion." Um, then obviously that's bad for stocks. <laughs> but if the dollar goes up on global growth, um, it's good for stocks. Um, the, there's a great article, if people want to go to it, written by um, R- Rob, um, Richard Burner, the, the head uh, um, economist from Morgan Stanley. And if, if you send me an email, I'll send you a link to it, or I'll send you the article. And he talks about the change um, uh, people are so concerned the dollar's going up in value, corporate earnings are going to be hit. But it, it doesn't happen that way. I mean, that's just for people to come trotting out on CNBC and scare people about. But there's <laughs> been a, you know, it goes to tr- the trade-weighted dollar, and, there's been a, and it goes to the idea that exporters don't want to lose uh, market share, plus they hedge and other things. So it's not direct, and it's actually declining the impact of a rising uh, dollar, um, the negative impact on earnings is declining. So, um, at this stage, we would say don't really buy into that strong dollar corporate earnings in trouble idea. We think a strong, we think the dollar will continue to rally once we get through this on global growth. And the fact is that the U.S. penetration of exports um, is is 
has been has been very very good over the last several years, meaning the penetration sending exports to the emerging market areas um, uh, in in a very big way. So that we think that all is beneficial, and it'll be the type of scenario that we saw in the 1990 to 2002 bull market. And this is our positive view of the world once we get through this, and that the U.S. is going to pull in a lot of assets because the assets look relatively cheap. And if you have a growing economy, and the Fed finally gets gets out of its uh, own way, which we think it's going to move obviously faster than the Bank of England, Bank of Japan, and um, the European Central Bank, so the yield differential is going to tend to increase. We can see a money flow to the U.S. pushing the dollar up um, in kind of a self-reinforcing process uh, on stronger U.S. corporate exports. Interesting. And the last point, at least unless somebody else has another question, because Jack's going to have to go, but. Uh, would you mind just expanding on the, your currency currents this morning? Gold and dollar. Jack, how long is this correlation going to play out? They're both moving the same way. <laughs> yeah, we were trying to make the point. Um, and again, you hear analysts say that if gold goes up, the dollar is going to be crushed. Um, or if the dollar goes up, gold is going to be crushed. And, and historically, if you look at the very long-term patterns, because gold and the dollar are mirror images for good economic reason, gold is priced in dollars the world reserve currency, if the dollar weakens in value, the relative dollar price of gold has to go up. But during periods of global, you know, distress, you see people moving into the gold and the dollar, and they move together. So the question is, how long are we going to have this, this risk out there in the world? So who knows? Maybe we have, you know, the euro continues to create systemic risk for six months. China breaks down. We see the dollar and uh, gold going higher really on the same type of theme, thematic, uh, of kind of safe havens. Um, people that, have, that don't want to necessarily go to the dollar but want to get money out of these other areas are going to go to gold. So that's why we see them move up together at points in times, as we did during the credit crunch. The dollar went up and gold um, either stayed flat or went up slightly at the same time with the dollar when every other asset class fell. The point we make is, um, or we made in there was, using some arguments to somebody else, but arguments we've used before, is that gold doesn't compete um, because it pays no yield. So when there's, a, there's, a, there's relative liquidity on people's, uh, you know, on, in, on financial institutions' balance sheets and other, peop, you know, and other big players, and they don't have real asset investment opportunities, gold looks like a, looks like a, a good storage place for that money. But if the world starts to normalize and we get through these risks and the rates start to increase, the yields start to increase, and there are real economic opportunities for, for capital investment, we think that money is going to come out of uh, places like gold um, and go into the real economy, also stretch for yield, um, and, and gold will start losing the game as, as, as interest rates you know, start to rise. And, and we think the dollar in that scenario of global growth continues up um, and, and gold breaks. There's a whole lot of questions and a whole lot of uh, thoughts on what happens to inflation, what happens to government debt, and they're all real, cons you know, real questions. Um, we would have had a written, you know, a 500 or you know, 500 page <laughs> dissertation, but that's <laughs> a general global macro view on the idea that um, that that sooner or later they will decouple again. And our, and our thought is that when they do decouple, it will be dollar beneficial and gold negative. Interesting. Uh, Jack, I have a question for you. Uh, it seems to me, maybe this is me, that the central banks seem to take a lot longer to make these decisions that seem, I hate to say that they're so easy, I'm sure they're not for political reasons, but, you know, for instance, the Australian central bank raises rates, and uh, the other day, a Canadian central bank raises rates, and it seems like we're going the other way. Everyone else is talking about deflation. And these guys, uh, well, Australia didn't do it recently, but they've done it in the past, and Canada just raised it. I mean, it seems almost backwards. Uh, uh, Jack, what do you think? Thank you for listening to our podcast. To find more podcasts on options, stocks, alternative markets, and market data, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts.